Hello everyone, today I'm going to just, uh, sort of just felt like talking about and rambling about is probably the more correct term about the Spanish Civil War again. Uh, today I will be sort of focusing more however on the aspects of um, the Welsh response to the Spanish Civil War and notably the the Welsh international internationalism of the communities there and um, the uh, sort of um, labour movement as well. Um, to sort of give a brief overview of maybe Welsh in internationalism, because uh, I feel that is though probably a subject that quite a few people may be uh, more unfamiliar with. Um, Welsh internationalism was quite strong during the early um, 20th century and it had been going on for um, a bit longer but yeah, it was strongest in the earliest, earliest, uh, early um, 20th century. Before then it had been um, mostly uh, const like sort of constrained to um, more so uh, religious movements like I think it was something called the Temple of Peace movement um, and that was the main sort of uh, um, source of internationalism as it was sort of this religious movement um, sort of the all coming together for uh, in the idea of like I think it was a Christian movement of course so come uniting the world under Christianity um, I think the leader of that movement was um, a, a Lord Davies or Dave Davis or Davies um, uh, he was uh, born into um, wealth and I am fairly certain, though I am not entirely sure if I'm remembering correctly or if I'm confusing him with someone else, but I believe that he um, he was a... Yes, yeah, I've got it up here now. Um, yeah, he was the owner of the Ocean Coal Company and he was... Um, yeah, he was quite in opposition to the um, South Wales Miners' Federation, which was the uh, biggest trade union and sort of the only trade union amongst the South Wales miners. And he was quite instrumental in sort of opposing the um, the uh, the miners and their struggles for better working conditions, especially as the industry began to collapse in the early 20th century. Um, he did take more of a sympathetic stance and was, uh, uh, like, sort of supported certain measures, like the seven-hour working day, and the, um, he also sort of seeked to, um, advise the other coal owners to not oppose the Federation so strongly, uh, because he sort of feared, um, the sort of backlash that that could cause and then he also started to uh yeah he also opposed the sort of widespread support amongst coal owners for the um uh, the miners industrial union which was sort of a company scab union uh, that was becoming quite popular but obviously opposed by the majority of workers and by the um south wales miners federation so he sort of saw this and he didn't really he was unsure whether it was sustainable to really keep support for the owners to keep supporting the scab union. But um, yeah, aside from that, he was quite critical of the miners and sort of talked about evil spirits that they had and stuff like that. Um, I think the internationalist ideas sort of in the Welsh labour movement and then which sort of then spread onto the communities because at this time, like um, a lot of the communities well, literal towns and villages would spring up around um, coal fields and coal, coal pits. Uh, so it was the labour movement and the communities were fundamentally intertwined. But anyway, um, internationalism kind of uh, arose amongst them uh, 
in sort of, as part of the labour movement. I think probably a lot of Marxist theory um, had a lot to do with this, um, simply because the idea of the sort of the international proletariat, uh, but also different things like, for example, um, the Russian Revolution was a source of inspiration um, for many, and uh, yeah, I'll cover more about the the Soviet Union and how that related to Wales probably after I just finish this bit of sentence here. But, um, yes, um, where was I? And then other sources would have been, well, um, yeah, there would have been a lot of um, migrants from other nations. There was a, um, a pit called the International Colliery, uh, which uh, had was renowned for sort of having um, people from France, Germany, and Spain. And then the Spa uh, Spain was quite a strong influence, I'd say, um, even before the Spanish Civil War, because essentially what happened was there was a, the first sort of large sort of influx was a, um, a large group of Spanish, uh, migrants. Uh, first there was a small sort of trickle as they began to, uh, change manufacturing processes to sort of maybe, uh, in the skit steelworks and stuff like that. So it led to the sort of the Spanish people being hired who had the experience for it, with it. But then after that, and then the sort of the idea of sort of hiring Spaniards uh, became established amongst the owners. They then, instead of getting the experienced Spaniards, they started to get um, the sort of, well, um, quote unquote, um, underskilled uh, Spanish workers. And they attempted to use these who were more sort of desperate for pay to undermine the wages of the Welsh miners. The problem was, for the owners of course, is that um, the Spanish people who they sort of um, imported in, they um, were all socialists or anarcho-syndicalists, and then that sort of spread amongst the uh, workers. A lot of the um, Welsh communities, they sort of report that they, um, after brief instances of sort of resistance where, um, of course, the Welsh miners kind of opposed the attempt to undermine their wages and sort of unfairly took it out on the Spaniards. Uh, after they saw the Spaniards and their organising, like, it was noted that the Spaniards never failed to pay their dues uh, to the Union, uh, the Wales, uh, the Federation, that is, and that they were really quite active, sort of, members of the community, that they then began to get along with the Spaniards. Uh, the real relationship might have been a bit more um, sort of complicated because um, essentially um, the anarcho-syndicalists uh, who were there in Daulais, they sort of wrote back to the um, anarchist press in Spain a lot and a lot of what they wrote was essentially just complaining about the Welsh miners who, um, in the view of the um, anarcho-syndicalists, were um, very poorly organised and uh, generally uh, not very good, and they were sort of warning other people in Spain not to come to Wales. But I suppose even that had to change, because eventually a, um, it was a, either someone who was Welsh or English. Unfortunately, I don't think much is actually known about this person, but they were either Welsh or either English, uh, certainly British in any case. And then they were then writing to the anarchist uh, press in Spain after the first sort of anarcho-syndicalists uh, returned to the country. Um, and then, um, yes, the uh, Spanish uh, workers there had quite a strong influence. Like, I think a branch of the um, Spanish Socialist Party was actually opened up in Daulais, or um, at least maybe it might have been the International Colliery. And then um, also uh, there was a pamphlet uh, that was published called um, The Miners' Next Step, and that sort of advocated for a really sort of decentralised, um, federated federation, because the federation was, of course, um, a typical union in that it had a rather bureaucratic leadership structure. Um, so this pamphlet proposed replacing that with um, direct sort of control by the workers, and this was believed to have been um, strongly sort of influenced 
by the anarcho-syndicalists. Although, as I said, due to the difficult relationships that did exist, it is possible that these ideas sort of came about independently. Um, oh, just a fun side fact. Um, the, it's believed that the person who coined the term anarcho-syndicalist uh, was a Welsh man who lived in this time and would have been interacting with um, the, uh, what's it called, the, um, the anarcho-syndicalists, that's the word, there. Um, but yes, and this was sort of the um, first sort of influences of international influences within Welsh communities. And again, with the USSR and the Soviet unions, they were quite influential because, uh, of course, they um, initially did a lot of um, international work through the Comintern, but also uh, other things. And again, just the sort of inspiring nature of the revolution before its later consequences and were well publicised. But um, uh, the Federation received large amounts amounts of money from uh, Russian trade unions and so a lot of like money that was used for then strikes against the um, the uh, for the miners was referred to as Russian money and so they got quite a lot of support that way and then um, occasionally unofficial delegates from the Soviet Union would come to visit um, South Wales um, and uh, one place that's especially of note is Mardi. Uh, it's a town, and it was known as Little Moscow. Because after um, the pits, they began laying off men uh, quite strongly. But even before that, um, they were uh, the Mardi um, the Lodge, which was sort of like the um, kind of like the base for the union in the area. Like it would sort of you'd have. In each sort of di uh, at this time it would have been districts. They later went into areas to deal with the amalgamation of the coal companies. But um, at this time it would have been districts. You would have had your lodges, and then you would have had different separate all of the workers in one town, like the miners that is, going to the one lodge, as well as unemployed miners going to the one lodge. Or yeah, in some towns they had two lodges, one for the employed, one for the unemployed. But then, um, and then in each town, the multiple towns and lodges would then compose a district, and then the district would send a representative uh, to sort of do things. But then there was also an executive council and stuff. But yes, um, that's not really relevant to the direct track thing. Where was I? Ah, yes, uh, Mardi was known as uh, Little Moscow because... Um, uh, yes, the person who was the head of the lodge there was called Horner, as his last name, and he was quite a strong militant and advocated for a lot more militant tactics for the Federation. Um, he was also a member of the Communist Party, and then although I say he was a militant, he um, sort of became a militant after um, he sort of witnessed a bunch of miners being um, victimised after strike actions. But he, um, he, uh, he still remained kind of less militant than the, well, not even less militant, he just had a difference in strategy and ideas about strategy with the, um, the majority of the Communist Party, because the Communist Party wanted the miners to separate from the Miners' Federation and start a new sort of more revolutionary, um, union. Whereas Horner thought it would be better to radicalise the Federation from within because the Federation was well established and was essentially a household name in South Wales. Um, but anyway, Horner was always quite active and because of this uh, and quite openly open about his communism uh, and communist beliefs. Uh, so, and he, uh, he was able to sort of radicalise, uh, well, all of the people in the local lodges were quite radicalised, and then as um, jobs started to be uh, left, uh, like, uh, got removed um, uh, amongst the unemployed, the unemployed were always uh, quite a bit more radical 
than the Federation. They had like the National Unemployed uh, Miners Union or something like that. Uh, yeah, and um, uh, yeah, the National Unemployed uh, Miners w w Workers Movement, sorry, it's the National Unemployed Workers Movement. Uh, they were set up by the Communist Party, so again, it was quite a strong thing. But anyway, the um, and then another thing in Mardi that was, of course, they had a uh, Miners Institute or a Working Men's Hall where they had libraries and um, uh, different Marxist classes uh, set up there. Um, that was actually, the library was initially set up by the original mine owner, but then sort of taken over, I think, by the local community and expanded upon. Like, it was a big place and it was the centre of the local community. A lot of minor institutes were like that, actually. Um, yeah, I think the owner fronted some of the costs for the place and then miners paid for the other bits but um yeah uh, that was a good source of literature and community organizing so uh through this sort of radicalization by horner as well as the strong sort of community radicalization and the influence the, the general sort of strong influence of the communist party there the place was known as little moscow and it was very very supportive of um, the soviet union and uh the support was likewise uh, they then received from people within the Soviet Union. Um, Horner was sent to sort of visit the Soviet Union and he came back with a banner that was specifically made um, for the town, uh, for um, South Wales by a group of um, Russian women and it was a nice sort of red banner with sort of golden writing in the traditional sort of Soviet colours, Soviet Union colours. Um, and it was like very, very um, well sort of uh, treasured by the town who would uh, who reserved its use for special occasions, which would have been the um, the mar uh, during funerals they would drape it over the coffin as they walked it to the or carried it to the um, its burial ground or wherever it needed to be carried, I suppose. Um, and then, yes, um, un unofficial delegates from the Soviet Union visited Mardi uh, on multiple occasions. And um, local school children were instructed to um, go and visit um, the Soviet Union. And they, because they did, um, anyway. And then uh, they were instructed to sort of bring back a report on what they saw to give to the local um Communist Party sort of reporting on the progress of the Soviet Union. Um, yes, I might use this picture as the thumbnail, but I believe there's a, uh, depending on whether or not I can find it. But um, yes, there's a picture of, oh, I, I, I might not use as a thumbnail, it depends. But any, in any case, there is a photograph that exists. It's in um, Hoyle Francis's book, um, The Fed. Um, and it's a nice little picture of the people of Mardi in their working men's hall with the banner in the background and a portrait of Lenin hanging up on the nearby wall. Um, little Moscow was eventually sort of uh, disowned by the Federation because they kept on sort of the lodge lodges there. Uh, they sort of kept on doing their own things and they were sort of quite victimised by the local authorities because um, uh, they were always quite sort of rebellious, of course. But I think the final straw was um, when um, a, uh, bailiffs were trying to um, empty a man's house. Uh, the bailiffs did not actually have permission to remove anything, or there was something wrong. I, I, yes, I think their claim to taking stuff was illegitimate. So, uh, Horner, I think, was involved, and a bunch of other local men, in including members of the local Salvation Army, uh, sort of all sort of rallied together to um, essentially uh, stop the bailiffs from taking anything, and then they were charged quite severely in court for doing this later um, upon being summoned. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the main sort of 
background, I guess, to the Welsh internationalism. Um, the next sort of bit is, of course, how it relates to the Spanish Civil War. And the main things to sort of talk about here are um, probably, of course, um, the International Brigade and um, the, uh, the intake of Basque refugees. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, and there's probably... I also know about some stuff that happened in Cardiff, so I suppose I'll focus on that now before moving on to the more broader sort of subjects. Um, so, um, in Cardiff, there was a, a, a lot of local Spaniards who had sort of came because um, there was always a strong relationship with, um, with the um, Spanish uh, regions of the Basque, the Basque counties and uh, Bilbao. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, but yes, there was uh, the strong relationship was there because sort of, of course, you would have sailors going back and forth from Cardiff and Bilbao. And, um, yes, uh, companies, um, in Wales owned mines in Spain and it possibly vice versa. Um, yes, uh, the aforementioned sort of, uh, company that was in Daulai, that it, uh, it first began importing Spanish workers after acquiring a, um, a mine in the, um, Basque regions. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to remember, there's a lot of different stories, and a lot of it was, they would, uh, the local sort of, um, spa when the war broke out, there were, um, Sp Spanish aides, yes, I suppose I have to go a bit broad before going specific, but, um, across Wales, and probably across Britain in general, I also know about South Wales, but, um, Spanish aid Com committees were set up across the country and they would sort of gather um food uh i think the main thing they sort of got was uh, money for milk and then milk itself to then send and food and different other things to send to the spanish yeah the republican spain um and this was quite actually the amount of stuff they raised was quite impressive because like people would, uh, you have to remember these were quite, um, po impoverished sort of communities, and yet they were still able to sort of, they would sort of supply the, um, the, um, sp 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 uh, the Republican Spain, and, yeah, and there were different events, like, I remember bid on the hat to raise money, and I think a ridiculously, I think it was the equivalent to, like, a wheat donation to Republican Spain. But, um, yes, in Cardiff, the aid com committed a lot of um, Spanish sailors who sort of um, fled into Cardiff and they had local Spaniards and to find them work and stuff like that. Um, one incident of note was a bunch of sailors, uh, they, they went and they docked, at, uh, they docked in Cardiff and they refused to go back to Spain because, of course, they feared punishment from Franco and the nationalists um and yes basically uh the local authorities didn't really know what to do if i'm correcting towards sending them back and i know the local sort of more conservative catholic press was um the local cardiff community opposed this as of course um the spanish aid committee did and um uh, eventually, uh, this sort of caused the Nationalist Party, which, if you're unfamiliar with, it's essentially a fascist organisation. Um, it decided to go, and they were going to forcibly try to, um, uh, forcibly try to, uh, capture the Spaniards from their boat, and, um, and, uh, Yes, uh, send them to Spain to be punished, which could have been death or, and it certainly would have been at least imprisonment. Um, this was opposed, however, they came and uh, they essentially, uh, well, they tried to storm the boat, but then the sailors um, pulled out like the thing that, um, I think, yeah, the thing that allows you to get from the dock onto the boat. 
so they were struggling to get on and then local people essentially fought them and forced them to leave and uh, yes one person of note um, for of course uh, the very bad reasons of being a fascist but one person of note amongst the fascists was um, William Joyce who of course would later to go on to be Lord Haw Haw, um, which um, if you're not familiar with, he was essentially a uh, Nazi who uh, broadcast Nazi propaganda um, during the Second World War. Um, but yes, so uh, I think the next thing I'll sort of discuss is the sort of volunteers to the International Brigade. So I think it was approximately 130, I think it was just under 130 International Brigade volunteers went to, um, went to Spain. The majority of these were not actually um, adventurists like a lot of members of the International Brigades were and a lot of them were dedicated um, communists because the Communist Party essentially took charge in Britain of sending volunteers to the International Brigades, uh, especially in Wales, where South Wales, where they had a rather strong presence. Um, this resulted, in, and there was actually quite a lot of influential people within the um, the, uh, to, to begin with, it was a lot of really influential people within the International Brigade. I think later on, they stopped doing, like, the very important people, because they needed the very important people to sort of stay behind, uh, to sort of continue uh, to insp uh, sort of organise everything within South Wales. So they started sending less important people. But they initially started sending important people, and I think, uh, yeah, one or two people became commissars. Uh, but they were essentially smuggled in uh, to Spain, and yeah, they did fight, and many were killed. I think might have been about 30 Welsh volunteers who were killed, and then the uh, a large portion of them were later captured and kept in prison uh, by the nationalists. Um, they, yeah, I don't think actually they were tortured too badly in the prisons or at all. Um, they were quite fortunate in that regards because they were international volunteers. So of course, I think the um, Francoist forces didn't want to be overly harsh to them because of course they would have faced backlash from the uh, international community for doing so. Um, but yes, uh, in Cardiff, the um, International Brigade volunteers were sort of smuggled through through um, the back of a bookshop while well, they would go and meet in the back of the bookshop, sort of discuss things and then they'd be sent to London and then from London they would be then sent to um, France and then through France they go through the Pyrenees into Spain. Um, the exception to them sort of being principled communists and like sort of dedicated to the idea of communism was probably, um, there were a few volunteers who were sort of more sort of just in the idea of sort of international proletarian solidarity, but not as necessarily total communists. Like a few people sort of joined up just because they knew, they sort of had the idea, which was in many ways kind of true, I suppose, that if fascism rose in one place, it would spread elsewhere. And of course, at this time, you would see groups like the British Nationalist Party in Wales uh, start to rise, although they tended to get beat up in Wales. They weren't really tolerated in South Wales um, that much. Um, but yes, anyway, as I was saying, uh, yeah, and they were sort of just more so heading up for those reasons. I know in one case, a man from Blackwood, the town of Blackwood, he ended up volunteering after he got absolutely drunk and then 
uh, with another chap, and then the next thing he knew, he was being signed up to go to the, uh, to volunteer as an international brigade, and he kind of, um, yeah, he, he didn't back, he, he, he had, yeah, he, he didn't back down after that, and he decided to go ahead with it. Um, what, uh, I think there was also a, aside from the South Wales volunteers, because South Wales was where the most sort of radical sort of activists were, uh, there was one volunteer from North Wales, uh, and then I think there was, yeah, uh, I also remember the one person of note was a Cardiffian, he was a member, he was... Uh, yeah, he considered himself Irish, and he was of Irish heritage, and he sort of, he was quite inspirational, because he, uh, yes, he he had more sort of, less of a communist sort of party attitude, and he actually rejected being made an officer, because he didn't like the idea of being an officer, and he, he approved more sort of the idea of the working class person, and yes, he had quite a few sort of interesting experiences like he was able to bond with a lot of the uh other international pr brigaders a lot more easily than the um than other brigaders were able to uh and yeah he had different there's different war stories of him doing brave things i think unfortunately eventually he was killed but uh that was one person of a note Another person of note was um, probably another volunteer who was, he was an adventurist, but he did not volunteer for the International Brigades, no, he, um, he went to, uh, the, um, to fight for the Nationalists, and he was the only person in Wales who did go to volunteer for Franco and the Nationalists, and yeah, he, he, like I, he, he says... That, well, he said up until that's, uh, he died, he died in peacetime, he only stayed for a sh relatively short while, he, um, but yes, he said that he went, um, for sort of a sense of adventure as a young man, though in the local sort of, uh, Catholic press, his father said he was going to sort of defeat the evils of communism, as it were, um, but yes, he sort of went there, and he f he fought for a b bit, but he decided to leave because there was increasingly anti-British sentiment um, amongst the nationalist troops. So he ended up uh, deserting and leaving with uh, Spain with a uh, with a um, a column of Irish volunteers for the nationalists. Um, yeah, so I guess the final bit that I shall discuss is, of course, um, the uh, Basque refugees. These were primarily children, but they were, uh, after, of course, the Basque regions were uh, completely sort of bombed to pieces and invaded by the um, nationalists, uh, the government kind of reluctantly, the British government kind of reluctantly accepted um, refugees, especially, of course, after the um, very sort of publicised atrocities that occurred in Guern uh, Guernica. Uh, I hope that, yeah, Guernica. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, uh, it was, yeah, so that was very well publicised. So the British government reluctantly took volunteers, but, um, yeah, and these, f uh, not, not volunteers, refugees, um, uh, but yes, although the government was reluctant, the, uh, South Wales community certainly were not, they were a local, sort of, house of a, um, I think a relatively wealthy Welsh lady was used to house hold a great number of them and uh, they were sort of received personal sort of tuition and care from a um, 
um, a very an influential local man. I think he might have been somewhat involved in the Communist Party. I can't. I really cannot uh, recall. I'm afraid. And then in yeah, but there were also children taken from uh, across South Wales to various locations. But they were absolutely sort of very welcomed. Uh, they were sort of taken around and uh, they sort of enjoyed doing sort of the Republican salute in photographs with the um, Welsh communities and sort of discussing um, everything that was happening and of course uh, the strength of the um, Spanish labour movement and the um, the sort of fight against fascism were very sort of well herald heralded because of this but they were also um, they also sort of became well known um, for their sort of skills in playing football, and they um, they were also uh, well known uh, for uh, well yeah they were taught to sort of play instruments and some of, of course they didn't they would have had some yes yeah, some of them would have been uh, playing music uh, beforehand but they was received tuition in instruments. And they would play for the local communities. And they went to quite a few different workers' rallies to play music. And they really became uh, part of the local communities. And eventually when they were returned to Spain, a lot of very, uh, local communities were very, very sad to see them go. Um, yeah, I suppose that's all I have really to discuss. Um, my main sort of sources for this have been, as I mentioned before, Hoyle Francis's book, The Fed, which I'm currently in the process of reading. Uh, the Fed isn't so much to do with the internationalism, but is more so to do um, with uh, sort of, well, the South Wales Miners' Federation and the uh, labour movement within the South Wales coal fields. But then there's also Hoyle France's other later book, um, uh, Miners Against Fascism, that really focuses on Welsh internationalism and the um, Welsh involvement in the Spanish Civil War. And uh, the other book would be um, Cardiff and the Spanish Civil War. I believe that's what it's called for. Let me just double check. Uh, yes, Spanish and the, uh, and uh, Cardiff and the Spanish Civil War, and that's by um, Rob Stradling. Um, but that's sort of my main sources, and then of course I've also uh, I think I li listened to a lecture about the Spanish anarchists. It, that's available on if you sort of Permaculture Now's channel on YouTube. And then I there's also a few sources on libcom, uh, dot yeah libcom, which would be of some use. So yes, um, thank you for listening to this ramble. I suppose I hope that it was of some interest or of some use to you. Thank you.